Okay, so let's talk about, I think, what must be the biggest news topic of the week, which is uh, megaton news, possibly even gigaton <laughs> disclosures from Phil Spencer in Polygon, where he's talking about various topics, uh, including handheld Xboxes, which we should be talking about shortly, but possibly the, the most seismic of statements, um, basically talking about adding third-party stores like the Epic Game Store and whatnot, maybe even Steam to Xbox. And wow, that basically upends the entire conception, the entire economy of how a, a console platform operates right now. Potentially huge stuff then. Um, John, what's your take on this? Uh, well, honestly, I, hearing Phil talk about this sort of concept kind of ties into what I've been trying to say on recent directs regarding the potential shifting of Xbox to a completely different style of hardware slash software combination. Yep. You know, the idea of like basically taking the Steam Deck style approach to it, where it's like run a game version of Windows, kind of like Steam OS is for Linux, uh, but open up the platform in a way that we've never seen before in a console. Uh, save for the Linux stuff on PS3, which was not really that comparable, I would say. Uh, so basically, it seems like there's potential here for turning the Xbox into what Microsoft originally wanted to, the Xbox to be, which is a PC in the living room. Um, and this is something that traditionally didn't make sense, didn't seem to work. Just, I don't think it was a something that would have made sense at the mass market level. But I think the Steam Deck and its success and the way Valve has approached it really has sort of, uh, it's shown a light on what's possible now with PC games and sort of uh, creating profiles and optimizing games for one or two target hardware platforms and making that actually work uh, on a large scale. The difference here, though, is that they're talking about things like Epic Games and other other storefronts that they don't run. Uh, which is the difference between, you know, Steam Deck obviously runs Steam OS and it runs Steam. So Valve does have cert a certain level of uh, customization options available for how they approach this. Uh, it could be a little bit tricky if they're using third party stores in the Xbox sense. And I really wonder what it means because there's no way they could just say, oh, yeah, all PC games work on your Xbox because realistically that would result in a bad experience for the consumer for games that perhaps don't run properly, both older games, which have compatibility issues or newer games, which perhaps are released post this hardware launch and are too powerful for the machine to run well, which obviously we see on the steam deck right now with some of the big new releases, but we don't have the full picture yet. Right. Obviously Phil's hinting at some potential for where they want to go, but there's a lot of questions we still have. I will just say, I think from Microsoft's perspective, let's face it, they have they they are not able to compete in the traditional console model at the moment. Uh, ever since Xbox One, basically, they've tried. They've done some good stuff since then. They did try to s basically fix some of the major faults with the Xbox One, but they never really pulled it off. I would argue, even though they've had a, they've had a good run of it. And I think that by shifting gears to this new sort of model, they're taking a path that, as I've said before, Sony and Microsoft cannot, sorry, Sony and Nintendo cannot actually follow because right. they, they are not in command of such something like Windows as Microsoft is, right? They can't do like a custom PC style thing. They are basically stuck in the closed ecosystem uh, traditional console model. So it's it's an interesting thing that micro, only Microsoft can really accomplish out of the current big three, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Oliver? Yeah, if this is what it looks like on the surface, and it basically just means other platforms releasing their entire catalogs or something, you know, a very comprehensive number of their older titles on Series X, I think it's a very com compelling idea personally. Um, obviously, you know, the series x series s could run a stripped back version of windows and could run these titles right um 
But I, I kind of think it's more of an appealing thing for older games, because for newer games, you usually do have a dedicated Series X or Series S version that you can run just fine. And that's a better tuned version, typically, I'd have to imagine, than a PC version that's dealing with like a split memory pool thing. And it's not going to be ideal, right, in that sense. So I think that's very compelling. And also, I don't know what the legal logistics of this would be, but it seems like potentially a very compelling way to just scrape up all those PlayStation PC exclusive titles. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> <Yeah>. You know, <laughs> run Final Fantasy VII Remake or something on a Series X, it seems totally plausible, right? Um, but I think there are some issues. On the technical side, I think that the unified pool of memory on the Series X and Series S could pose some issues. I don't know if the system would automatically provision the CPU and GPU or if that would be under user control. Again, this is adding some complexity that you don't really like to see. Obviously, there's enormous technical hurdles that just have to do with having to support maybe a cursor input on some level. That gets complicated. Certainly on the Steam Deck, that is not as much of an issue, but in large part on the Steam Deck, that's because it has built-in uh, touchscreen and built-in trackpads, which allow you to overcome those issues when they do occur. Um, and then I, I think you're going to run into some issues with RAM provisioning. Even looking at some other 16 gigabyte devices with unified RAM setups like the Steam Deck, you do run into some issues in higher end titles. Again, wouldn't be as much of an issue for older games. But then, of course, you have the 10 gigabyte Series S, which seems like its own kettle of worms. So I would personally, the way that I would look at this is this is a great way to play older titles on your series consoles and not like the way that you'd want to play like Avatar Frontiers of Pandora necessarily. That's a much harder right. ask. But for older legacy titles, I think it could be a really compelling way to boost that library and give you a lot more choice than you currently have. Mm -hmm. Interesting, Oliver, that you say that because in my mind, I was actually thinking of this more as them talking about future plans, not the Series X. Basically, like I don't, I'm not convinced that this is feasible on Series X, and I'm not sure that's what they're talking about. Uh, I suspect this when they talked about the biggest leap ever for next generation consoles, perhaps this is what Phil was talking about it was like a gigantic shift in their entire strategy. Uh, but I, I don't think that necessarily includes Series X. Although, obviously, I think they'll have to continue to support it. They can't just abandon it. But for next generation, you know, all bets are off. Where do I begin with this? Um, first of all, when Phil makes comments like this, he knows uh, exactly what he's doing. He's not just sort of, you know, sitting about having a coffee and musing, you know, about potential stuff. You know, if he's putting this stuff out it's definitely firmly in contention for actually happening, right? I mean, this guy produces uh, comments which, you know, come to pass sometimes years ahead of when he made them. And I think that's one of the things that I respect about him because, you know, he's willing to, you know, actually engage and get the stuff out there, lay the groundwork. I suspect there's probably, I mean, at this point, Phil is like CEO of gaming, not just for Xbox, but for PC as well. So, you know, he's going to be thinking not just about the next couple of years, but, you know, anything up to the next 10 years, possibly even more than that. What does gaming with, within Microsoft look like at that point? And uh, bringing Xbox and PC together aligning them more closely just makes a lot more sense. What's surprising me is that he's talking about it right now because it does kind of suggest that, you know, you will see this happening in the next couple of years, which could possibly mean that the next console is being brought forward to 2026, as many people are suggesting, or it could mean that maybe there will be some movement on Xbox Series X. Because if we look at what is theoretically possible, um, with the Series S, it's just too resource constrained, particularly mm -hmm. in terms of memory, in order to be able to run PC games on it as is. Older titles, possibly, right? You know, from the days where you had, you know, two gigabyte, four gigabyte GPUs and four gigs of RAM, system RAM, possibly, you know, that would work. Series X is going to be a bit more of a challenge because it's got 16 gigs, which is kind of enough to do uh, a lot of games. Um, but when you start divvying up that 16 gigs into video RAM and system RAM, which is the way PC works, things get a bit more complicated. And I think, Oliver, you alluded to the fact that, you know, 16 gig handheld systems are starting to reach, uh, they're starting to have issues. Like Alan Wake, mm -hmm. for example, uh, requires you to jump through hoops to get it running even on a ROG Ally. Um, and then again, there's right. also the um, this, the Series X has that fast 
pool of memory and the slow pool of memory. So how would that translate into the PC space? Um, so the timing of it makes me think maybe something would be happening, you know, the, in terms of the timing of the statement. Maybe something is happening with Series X because, you know, why why talk about this now? You know, if hardware is two years away, three years away, four years away, um, Series X could possibly do it. You know, the, the wizards in terms of compatibility at Xbox are not to be underestimated. True. Um, in terms of what would actually be required, it would just be, you know, a more generalized driver, I guess because it's already an, a Windows-based system, um, it, but it would need, um, I think, primarily a video-based driver. It would need to be running Windows, I think, uh, a more generalized version of Windows to cope with some of the more esoteric stuff like um, uh, anti-cheat technologies, for example, something that, that Steam Deck struggles with. So, you know, I think it's viable on Series X, not Series S. Um, but how yes, would you, how would you even communicate that to the players, though? Yes, yeah, it's, it's tricky, right? It would be a kind and of Series X is the, thing. It's the lesser selling machine as well, so it's kind of like you know cutting off most of the audience, which is still why I don't think it would apply to Series. The consoles. other, the other uh, point potentially is that it's built into the design of whatever this handheld they're talking about. Yeah. I mean, there's so much mm -hmm. handheld talk. I mean, we've got an entire news topic lined up about it later. That it could well be that this is where it starts, right? Um, that's where, you know, so, I, I suspect the handheld will arrive a lot sooner than the next gen console. One interesting thing is uh, when we last spoke with Phil, uh, we got into a debate about game preservation and ownership of games. And, you know, there's those are two separate things. Like, he knows that I love physical media, and that's more like an ownership thing. Uh, versus actual preservation i would say yes. by and large and we ultimately came to the agreement and he's right on this that you know the real preservation happens on the pc especially yeah. with uh drm free stuff you know but yeah that's a, that gets a little bit tricky but that's where preservation happens it's the pc it's not these closed platforms and you know based on that conversation and like the stuff he's saying now i really it really does become clear that he's thinking about this in a very different way from the traditional console model of having everything locked down. And if this is indeed the future that they're going towards, I can also understand why they are suddenly sort of shifting away from even bothering with discs at all. Uh, right. Which, you know, it's I kind of accepted that that's just where Xbox is and that's what Xbox is going to do. I can see why they would want to get out of that market. That's they're not selling a lot of discs as far as I know. Uh, and the audience has mostly shifted over to either digital purchases or game pass. Right. It's so, difficult to buy the discs at this point for Xbox. Yes. Yeah. Especially like the Xbox sections, retail sections have largely been decreasing. Like even in Germany where there's still a lot of physical media out there, like Xbox sections are, have become tiny and outdated. Like they're just not really selling much for it. Um, which I always thought was a little bit odd. And they kind of handicapped themselves. The fact that one series S doesn't support discs, obviously. Right. Um, yeah. And then also uh, just the fact that, uh, you know, game pass is obviously a big deal and all this. Other, there's a, there's a lot of factors there that sort of makes it, well, I can understand why it, it would be shifting in this direction. Yeah, the, the 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 shift in direction just does seem to be more like a kind of uh, steam model. Where exactly. It's a, it's a storefront that runs on a lot of different systems and they have a host system which they carefully curate. That kind of makes sense to me. I'm looking at this Polygon interview again and there's something else here which uh, is surprising, which I think is a seismic change in the way that the economies of the console market work, which is at the moment the point is that um, console hardware is sold at a loss and then the uh, the cost is, um, is is kind of clawed back via you know game purchases, subscriptions, that kind of thing. Oh, of course, the cut that the uh, platform holder takes from all of the third parties for hosting those games. Typically, the reason why this happens is that you get a low cost piece of hardware out there, and then um, you know the mainstream buyer is is more attracted to that and buys into the console and therefore the ecosystem, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Phil seems to be saying here that um, this model isn't really working anymore. He doesn't think it's not expanding the market, and it sounds like he wants to do away with it. And we have heard these rumours 
for a long time now that basically an Xbox could be a design of of PC that you know anybody can make if they fancy it, um, which I find quite interesting. I'm wondering if that's the way it's going to go and whether instead of having a subsidized model, Phil is looking at competition between um, Microsoft and third party vendors to produce their own Xboxes. Any thoughts yeah. on that, Oliver? I think in an era of cross platform gaming and very homogenized PC hardware, it makes a lot of sense because the consoles aren't really differentiating themselves on a hardware level and on a software level, they don't really either for the most part. So I think that they could offer a lot of potential hardware configurations to address like very large segments of the market. Now, in terms of subsidizing those configurations, you're going to have a lot of trouble if you're not controlling and getting a decent cut from those stores, right? Which is another point of contention. Mm. But I think that, you know, with the Xbox UI as kind of a front end for running Windows software and some work making sure that those games run with a good graphics configuration, at least by default on Xbox systems, sort of like we see now with the Steam Deck, I think that would be really compelling. Um, I think the hardware maybe poses a bit of an issue there uh, in terms of defining minimum specifications. Like, do you yep. say, oh, here's the minimum spec for four years, and then we're moving up the minimum spec in terms of hardware? Because presumably you have new hardware releases happening very frequently with this model, right? Um, and then in terms of the platform thing, I kind of think that the end of Xbox as an exclusive console platform is probably already written <laughs> as far as this is, uh, right. is concerned. So is that a bad thing, good thing or bad thing? I, I think in this case, it's probably a good thing, but I'm not too agitated about that. Like if you assume that Microsoft takes a really aggressive multi-platform stance in the years to come and, you know, Windows is being treated like kind of a second class citizen at the moment, I think it makes a lot of sense to consolidate your efforts behind the potentially much larger group of Windows PCs that could be developing the software, could be running the software, and try to organize the Xbox around that and sort of more like the original Xbox pitch was organized, right? The direct Xbox. Um, I think that would be yeah. really interesting and really compelling potentially. And, you know, the only thing that's really keeping Windows gaming from being a really good fit for the living room, in my opinion, is a lack of a really good console-centric interface to launch games and to play games from. I think that's the main issue. And if Microsoft can overcome that, which I, I have every belief that they can, um, then they could have a really compelling uh, product category, <laughs> I suppose. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a case of how those third party stores are going to be implemented. Is it going to be just like a compatibility layer with standard Windows? Uh, I'm not sure that would work. I think if you look at the Steam Deck and the way that the, you know, the whole Steam client has been integrated into the hardware, it's going to be down to the likes of Steam and Epic to produce client stores like that that actually work, even if the games that are actually being booted are essentially PC games. But um, I find this whole thing really quite interesting. And the concept that Xbox is basically moving away from what we consider to be the archetypal uh, console model. You look at Steam Deck and it, it's, you know, you can't argue that it's not a console. It is and it works. Um, and it's the one mm -hmm. thing I guess it's lacking is the third party integrations there because you can do it, but you have to go through a it has to be Linux compatible. You have to go to the Linux desktop to do it. So Microsoft seems to be taking this one step further. I guess, you know, looking at the PC space, um, you can have a situation where there's like a first party of sorts producing hardware and then third parties producing their variants because you see it with like PC graphics cards. Um, you see it with, um, I suspect, you know, if Microsoft are going to be doing it, they would have their own third part uh, sorry first party handheld but i suspect it would have much in common with say the you know whatever a next generation rog ally looks like and you know as long as you can get an xbox client on there and it and it hits the hardware specification that microsoft is uh, going to be going for there's no reason why you couldn't install Xbox on there and get an Xbox experience. This is, I think, the greatest strength of Microsoft in this scenario is that not only do, are they obviously in control of Xbox, but they are steering the path of PC gaming via Windows. Mm -hmm. So why not bring all of that stuff closer together? The ramifications in, you know, the, the, the sort of headlines in the short term won't be particularly flattering to Microsoft in some respects because we are looking at, the end of the traditional console model for Xbox. But, you know, if Xbox becomes something similar to Steam, I'm, I'm not against that. 
more games running on the system. The other thing, of course, is, you know, the concept that you would just get instant access to basically the entirety of the legacy PC library, which I, th I think would be pretty amazing, right? Yeah, hundred percent. <laughs> if if it's indeed possible, I think that would be a super cool thing to do. I'm, for I'm them. just seeing this as like two layers. You have your um, Xbox gaming operating system, the the Xbox yeah, yeah, yeah. possibly, and then you know it can just uh, move out onto a more generalized PC platform that you probably wouldn't get maximum performance from it, but it would still be pretty impressive, right? You know so, what? Thinking about this also, like I I don't know how far they would actually go, but like. Uh, you know, with the dev mode on, on Xbox, like on Series S, for instance, I had a great time with Audi just going through um, DOSBox Pure on there, where we were just loading up lots of random prepackaged DOS games that all just run and start on the Xbox, and they even have an interface to handle all the mouse and keyboard stuff, and it worked. It was super cool, and if Microsoft, like, imagine that with this more open platform, store vendors could set something up like that. Like, what if GOG was allowed to get involved, for instance, uh, and you could start putting out all these classic PC games that have been somewhat customized to work on that system. I think that's super compelling, and it's it's something unique that uh, would allow them to embrace both modern and retro gaming. Yeah. Uh, any final thoughts on this, Oliver? No, I just think it's a really interesting idea, and I think if you look at kind of the tapestry of what we're looking at now in the news, like with Chris Dring from GamesIndustry.biz reporting that you know, people are not so enthusiastic about Xbox and the development side of things with respect to their market share and maybe people are canceling projects. It does make a lot of sense for Microsoft to say, hey, we, we actually can't really survive in the conventional console market. And maybe the existing console business works pretty well for Sony. Certainly they've had their issues as of late, but it seems to be working okay for them. It's not working yeah. comparably well for Microsoft and obviously they need to change something. Sorry, there's just a question here of survival and um, strategy. I think, you know, they probably could survive on the existing model, but the point that Phil continually makes is that he wants to, you know, basically widen the total addressable audience and it can't be done with the existing console model. Uh, so I think that's part and parcel of what's going on here. Okay, so we've got some supporter questions on this. Let's take this one first of all from Lavanda Davis with uh, reports of Microsoft allowing third-party stores on Xbox. I think that quote-unquote walled garden storefronts are coming to an end. Apple has been in legal trouble twice for such practices and eventually all devices will have to accept alternative storefronts. What are the chances that Sony and uh, Nintendo will voluntarily open up or will governmental oh. forces do it for them? <laughs> Um, this could be another element of Phil's strategy here, which is to say, hey, this stuff is happening and we don't really want to be caught up in it. How do we, you know, preemptively get away from that and how do we make it work best for Xbox? Um, it's, a, it's an interesting thought there. I mean, um, Tim Sweeney's arguments um, have been primarily against Apple and um, Google and not really against the console manufacturers because his argument is that the subsidized model, um, you know, makes it less monopolistic in some way. Yeah, it only it's, he's only having that attitude because the consoles don't affect him. <laughs> there's been a lot of... Um, I have some issues with some of the the battles that Tim has been fighting under the the guise of trying to be like the good guy, but I don't think that's true. Well, he has been with Fortnite. He's been able to dictate terms to a certain extent with um, the platform yeah, holders. Exactly. So maybe maybe that's why there's less beef there. But you know, I can I can well see the EU not taking the same view that, <laughs> that you know the, the consoles and um, uh, you know are, are different in some way than a smartphone. So I do think there is probably an element but, of strategy. Uh, I don't know, though. When you think about this opening up, that really creates so many problems for these machines because you can't really just have easily have an open storefront on such different architecture. Like, look at the, something like the Switch, right? Yeah. What are you going to do there? Like, just have a bunch of... It's like, oh, yeah, now you can run... What are you going to run? Windows? Like, I, it just... No, are people going to make stores for opening it? Opening like, up the platform doesn't change the nature of the platform. That whoever uh, wants to enter that market would have to compete with Switch I, games. The problem, man. See, that's that's that it. Ju that just create. 
<laughs> no, I, I'm just worried that this, to some degree, creates the problem that a Nintendo originally solved back in the 80s, the thing that sunk Atari and all that, where they just the platform was wide open, anybody could put any junk on there, and the Switch is already dangerously close to that, even with these restrictions in place. Wow. Like, the eShop sucks. There's so much garbage on there. <laughs> and, like, imagine if the floodgates to that open further, and anyone could put anything on there. Like, you're going to be drowning in just, like, complete, like, digital bile. There will be, like impossible to find anything (laughs) even remotely good on that system uh that's like that's the big risk i see uh nobody's forcing you to install a third-party storefront uh, i know but it's just i I, we'll we'll see how that goes it just i'm still skeptical that that's a great idea for if a machine stays in the traditional model i don't think that's a great idea what microsoft's proposing is more like this is this is this runs PC games rather than like here's an alternative store. Well, I think a, sort. another element of this that's very important is if you look at what the EU is doing and when you look at what the United States is trying to do in their various antitrust cases. I think that this is the direction of travel for the industry, but I also think that Microsoft is in a position where they can say, "Hey, you know, we have a box that could run Windows." And we could get all these games on it, and we could actually have a business model that's compatible with the idea of operating multiple third-party storefronts and trying to get a bigger chunk out of the hardware or trying to get a chunk from those storefronts, right? They have a business model that's sort of more compatible with that idea. And if they say, hey, listen, you know, EU, America, whatever, we've shown we can have a console model with this open uh, architecture and our competitors aren't, so you better force them to do so. It could put Microsoft, or rather could put Nintendo and Sony in a more challenging position than it would put Microsoft. I also think that's potentially an, an element of what's going on here. Yeah, fair enough. For this uh, question from Big Man Upstairs. A good morning, gentlemen. Uh, regarding Sp- Phil Spencer's hints at the possibility of integrating Steam with Xbox, I think it's more third-party stores, but possibly Steam, right? It wasn't even mentioned by name in the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, do you think this would make Sony more hesitant to release their games on Steam, especially if it means those games could be <laughs> playable on Xbox on the same day they're released? Alternatively, might Sony consider launching their own platform on PC, limiting PS5 games to their exclusive store fund? Adding Steam to Xbox would be a significant win for Xbox. However, how open do you think Sony would be to allowing such a development? Uh, uh, well, you know, ultimately, you know, if they want to sell PC games, they've got to be on Steam, right? Yeah, I, I don't think that would dissuade Sony from jumping on Steam further. They've I mean, already they, got like a year to two years. Yeah, they already have that gap. And if they can sell more copies, so be it, right? It's not, I don't think it's a problem for them. I mean, conversely there's been all the talk about xbox putting stuff on playstation right yeah and if this kind of happened the reverse way through this sort of method you know i think it is what it is and i think sony would just accept those sales (laughs) yeah but there's also the possibility that sony just has contracts or could have contracts in the future that would just preclude this software being offered on an xbox console right uh Mm, I think that would be really tricky to enforce. If if it's an open storefront, how do you enforce that? Yeah, it screams anti-competitive behavior. Exactly. (laughs) Especially if Microsoft has their games on on PlayStation, you know, it it creates an even stronger argument for not allowing that. So I I don't think Sony would win that. The EU in particular has been quite sort of um, aggressive in uh, sort of making these things more open. I honestly think that Microsoft could possibly be a target for this and they want to get ahead of it. And it would basically produce like a fickle down effect that would apply to everybody else at some point, I think. I don't think, you know, ultimately it would affect Sony too much. Um, We just have to wait and see. We still don't really know what form this is all going to take. Another thing that's interesting is that uh, if Microsoft essentially changes like str- hardware strategy and like it's more open I, I was thinking of how like you know with the new switch coming out there's still going to be that desire to target a somewhat lower spec piece of hardware so um i, I feel like that will continue to influence games going forward perhaps yeah and if sony's the only one playing in the uh the big new console space in the traditional model that makes it harder to justify support for them perhaps i don't know Mm-hmm. Uh, just there's a there's a lot of stuff to think about with this. I I haven't fully formulated all of my thoughts yet, but it is it is interesting because this is, would mark a big change in the console business. I think in summary, we've just had like 
initial hints from Phil about this, the mm -hmm. actual deployment of the strategy, when it's going to happen, what form it's going to take, that's going to be quite an interesting thing to watch unfold. But we just don't really have the insight from that because we don't really have any further details right now. But certainly it's uh, quite seismic stuff, just the implications and how that's going to affect the next generation Xbox is is going to be interesting because that one, you would think, would be designed around this strategy.